well, we are currently more than halfway through the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, which is a global campaign aimed at challenging violence against women and girls. Today is also the 34th anniversary of the Ecole Polytechnique shooting in Montreal, which is one of Canada's deadliest femicides, where 14 women were killed. And in recent years, we have seen a rise in femicides across this country. Here to address this urgent crisis is Marissa Kokoros, the founder and executive director of the national grassroots organization, Aura Freedom. Marissa, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you so show. much. Thank you. Thank All you. right, so let's get into this conversation by just defining what is femicide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, femicide is the killing of women and girls, primarily by men, um, based on their sex or gender. Men who are driven by misogyny, and a need to maintain power and control over their victims. Um, in Canada, every two days, a woman is killed violently, uh, most often by a man, and most often by a man she knows. And it's because, precisely because she's a woman. Mm -hmm. Indigenous women and girls in Canada uh, pay the highest price of femicide and are murdered at 12 times that rate. Wow. And yes, other marginalized women, black women, women of color, migrant women, and others also face um, increased risks of femicide in Canada. Mm. Uh, you, there are a lot of misconceptions about femicide. Yes. I'm sure you know many of them through your work. What are some of the most common ones? Yeah, um, the most common one is that it's perpetrated by a stranger, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, and this does happen, but more often than not, women and girls face the greatest danger in their own homes. And are, when they are murdered, they're more likely to be murdered by men that they were supposed to trust, mm -hmm. supposed to be able to trust, um, like intimate partners, husbands, fathers, and brothers. Another misconception is that femicide is the result of someone snapping. So the mental health crises of someone, mm -hmm. when that really erases the long trajectory and the history of violence that led up to that femicide. Mm -hmm. And also, <clears throat> there are many women who are struggling with mental health and we're not out here killing men. And there are many men who also struggle um, and they're not violent. So the mental health framing of that really needs to change. Mm. Um, one other thing I want to add, it's not really a misconception, but that people don't know is that children are often killed in the context of femicide. And it's something we don't talk about. And children, um, as a way to inflict the most amount of pain and maintain control of their partner, a ex-abuser will kill his own children mm -hmm. in order to hurt uh, the mother in the worst imaginable way. And about 30 children will die this way in Canada every year. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that is unbelievable. <clears throat> uh, thank you for framing it that way as well. You say there are a number of risk factors that um, authorities and average Canadians yeah. could be looking out for mm -hmm. to curb the rise of femicides in Canada. So what are some of those risk factors? Yes, femicide is preventable. It's one of the most preventable forms of, of murder. And so very often we look at these when it's too late, but a recent separation, um, of the woman from her partner, a history of misogynistic views and extreme views like white supremacy. We also see um, when someone has a history of violence against women in general, mm -hmm. whether it's from a previous relationship or that relationship, tech facilitated stalking and harassment. And those are some of the most common mm -hmm. risk factors. And very often we just kind of look at them when it's too late. Mm. Now, your organization, Aura Freedom, launched a campaign for the 16 Days of Activism against gender-based violence, specifically aimed at femicide. Uh, I want to pull up the campaign image here. It says, uh, the bag women in Canada are dying for. This is a bold Oof. message. Wow. Can you tell us why you chose it? Well, there's no delicate or gentle way no. of introducing femicide. We're tired of ignoring it. We're tired of our leadership ignoring it, of Canada ignoring it, of the world. We have to constantly repackage violence against women so that it's easier to digest. We sanitize it, we explain it away. Mm -hmm. With this campaign, this is our battle yeah. call. We're saying, no, no, no more. Uh, when will women and girls matter enough? And we did this campaign in sisterhood with the Native Women's Resource Center of Toronto, mm -hmm. who contributed to our microsite to connect uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls to femicide, and also with the Canadian Femicide Observatory. So there is a microsite where you can learn more and where you can sign our petition. Okay. That's great. Well, That's your organization to... launched a petition to get femicide declared an emergency in Canada. Now, in this larger conversation, why is that so critical? Because there's been 
you know, historically, there's a lack of value placed on women's lives and even their deaths. Mm -hmm. We're still calling them homicides. Mm -hmm. Canada has not officially recognized the term femicide in any legislation or in the criminal code. Mm -hmm. um, and so with this declaration, um, and we, we're hoping to hit a, a thousand signatures today, you can sign the, the petition online. Mm -hmm. We're hoping that we can at least recognize the term femicide, that femicide exists and start there. We can't address the problem if we can't name it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, women and girls and, and their lives and their deaths matter. Yeah, absolutely. Now you say we need to put more focus and funding towards prevention, yes. uh, which makes a heck of a lot of sense. Yes. What priorities should be at the top of that list though? <sighs> Addressing root causes. It's such a hard conversation to have because funders want immediate results, but I like I always quote Desmond Tutu, who was an anti-apartheid activist from South Africa, and he said, we need to stop pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. Mm, that's in, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> that is the basis of Aura Freedom's work and so many advocacy organizations. What do we see in the violence against women sector is this revolving door of a woman leaving a shelter with her children and another one arriving. Mm. And that revolving door to be sure is life-saving and needs robust funding, but just as important is to go upstream, address patriarchy, address colonialism, address white supremacy. And we have to really look at the entrenched beliefs of women and men if we don't, we're going to be here in another 10 years. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. All right, so if there's a woman watching right now who's experiencing violence with their intimate partner or they know somebody mm -hmm. who is experiencing mm -hmm. that kind of violence, what do you want them to know? That they're not alone. Mm -hmm. That one in three women, and there's a lot of women here today, will and have experienced violence in her lifetime. Um, and that you deserve to live a life free from violence. You deserve kindness and respect. And there are services out there. My colleagues on the front lines are doing life-saving work and they care. Um, but I want to also say that when we think about getting help and why doesn't she just leave? Mm. If we look at all the barriers in place, mm -hmm. I want to flip the switch from why doesn't she just leave to understanding those. Many women have to choose between living in poverty or leaving a violent home, mm -hmm. right? Or migrant women, there are language barriers and immigration status. Um, women of color and indigenous women do not trust the police and other child welfare agencies and such. And so what are the barriers facing women? So when we talk about getting help, I want us to really flip the switch and when we rise and empower women, we all win. You know, women carry the communities on Absolutely. their backs for the back home. Yes. Every society. Every um, society. Marissa, to you and your team, a big thank you for all of this work that you, you are doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. As Andrea mentioned, if you or anyone you know is experiencing domestic violence, you can visit the federal government's website. It is womengenderequality.canada.ca. It is up on the screen right now. To find gender-based violence resources specific to your province, you can also find that at that website. Hey there, what did you think? Drop your comments below and join the conversation. And don't forget to like and subscribe so you can find more on everything from food and fashion to pop culture and current events. See you soon.